Welcome everybody. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Matt Mashandaro, CEO and President of ESP Guitars USA. Nice to meet you, Matt. What's up? Are you ready? Nice to meet you too. I, I know it's been a while putting this together, so we're, we finally made it. Yeah, we are so. not that close anyway. So, <laughs> and I, nine hours also difference for the, for the timetable. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Matt, I wish to start our interview by asking you what is your role in the company nowadays and how you started working at ESP? Well, I wasn't a hired to be president, let me put it that way. I was on in the touring business. I was uh, the last thing I did before working for ESP was tour manager for Motorhead. And I knew that. I wasn't going to be doing it much longer. I just uh, didn't really want to go through middle age and still be, you know, working on the road. And I knew the people at ESP because they were in New York and that was my home. And I had an open offer from them to, uh, for a job there. So in uh, early 87, I took them up on it and I did whatever needed to be done at the time. There was only five or six of us in the whole company. And whether it was sales or artist relations or, you know, anything, that's how we operated back then. You know, less than half a dozen people doing everything. And uh, a year or two into it, someone from the parent company came over from Japan. I remember they took me out to lunch and uh, said to me, Matt, you're in charge now. And w when you're young, I, I don't know how this is going to translate, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And instead of being intimidated by it, I just dived right in. And I had a lot of support from, from, the, from the owner. And with some hits and misses along the way, uh, we made it to where we are. So that's a very short version of a 35-year-old story, but that that's, uh, answers your question as to how I started. I just went in, you know, not knowing what I was going to be, uh, not knowing what was going to be put in front of me, but uh, we made that okay. Yeah, just to make a long story short, you you did well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did it well, Matt. Right. Yeah. So... It took a long time to really turn the company around because we were struggling a lot in the early years. But uh, eventually, you know, a few things happened. That, and, and, and I think you have another question regarding to what were some milestones exactly. along the way that exactly. made a difference for us. Yeah. So. But anyway, ESP's history goes back many years, as you said, starting off in a small workshop inside a music store. And during the 70s, the brand was established prim primarily in Japan. Still then, from the mid-80s, it moved to New York City and jumped right into the rock and heavy movement, following and supporting mm -hmm. the development of bands such as Slayer and Metallica. Has the way to develop a new instrument changed since those days? And are guitarists nowadays looking for a more versatile instrument as opposed to a more specialized guitar or bass? Developing an instrument, uh, one of the big differences between now and back then is it takes a lot longer now. Um, back then we were small enough that I was making a lot of the decisions myself as to what the product line would be and I was only working with one factory that was exclusive to ESP owned by ESP. So we could basically turn on a dime when it came to getting new samples made and new new product in the system. Now there are more people involved in making those decisions, which is a good thing. And uh, more factories that uh, we, we use all over Asia and one in, in Hollywood. And each factory has its own strengths and weaknesses and, uh, you know, skill levels and delivery times and so it's a little bit more complicated getting uh, new models made 
So, uh, but that comes with the territory as as you as the company grows. Uh, we can't remain with a small a small boutique guitar company like we started out. Otherwise, we we probably wouldn't be having this conversation because yeah, indeed, ESP would not be of interest to enough people. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. And, and and as far as uh specialized or uh versatile instruments, I would say people look for are looking for both in many cases. Uh maybe more specialized because um people are used to getting, especially from ESP, which was part of our attraction originally to people, getting instruments made their own way. And from ESP, at least, they know they can get maybe uh, an instrument based on a classic design, but with a custom graphic or custom inlays or, or locking tremolo or uh, specialized electronics. So uh, that's why a lot of people come to us, because they don't have to settle for something off the shelf as, as they once may have had to. So if you want to call that specialized, I think that's probably most of what we do and uh versatile i think a lot of the versatility comes with uh comes from the player um you know you can't really make an instrument that's great for every style of music by the way you build it if you can't play it then that's true you know it doesn't really matter so 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 uh both versatile and specialized but probably more specialized okay so talking about history during the last decade, we saw a moment in which the guitar and music was almost disappearing, both from the records and from the hands of, of young producers. Maybe we seem to be after more technological tools like digital controllers, loopers, and so forth. However, in the last couple of years, it looks like the interest in ensemble music and especially guitar-driven music has also increased thanks to some young rock bands. So the question is, mm -hmm. has it be become a, a challenge for a manufacturer to follow the numerous new music trends and catch up with new technologies? Or is it stimulating in finding new solutions? And last but not least, how do you feel the guitar will still be um, a leading instrument in the next 50 years? Well, the, the guitar industry uh, has been on an upward tra trajectory almost since the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan. With, you know, with a few bumps in the road, of course. Um, if you think about disco, that's one of the most obvious ones. I'm glad I wasn't selling guitars in the 70s because there must have been some panic among the guitars, you know, in the guitar industry when the guitar almost dropped out of sight and uh but sure enough it came back and uh the the elec the uh, electronic music that uh where the guitar had uh, played a much smaller role that's been that's been popular lately did create some concern in in the guitar making industry but uh i think that guitar uh driven the music, call it hard, harder rock or metal, whatever you want to call it, never disappears uh, or ha never did this, never hasn't disappeared. It just may have taken a, a, a smaller role in popular music from time to time, but it's always been there. Um, and I think it will continue. And I, I, right now the guitar market is stronger than ever. It's one of the most popular instruments for younger people who want to learn an instrument, which is always good for the future of any industry. Um, but we don't chase trends necessarily. Uh, and if there isn't a trend towards electronic music, then uh, we don't necessarily try to build guitars that will follow that trend because it's, if the guitar is not involved in the performing or creating of the music, it's hard to you know, sort of wedge it in there. You know, you have to make a guitar for people who want to play guitar. Uh, and it, it's it's something that uh, 
did create some concern in the past few years, but I think if you talk to most guitar companies now, they feel that we've made made it past it. Yeah, maybe also so. just because uh, I guess the number of instruments sold, I mean, I'm talking about guitars, has increased a lot because of this pandemic situation also, isn't it? Yes, uh, we... As guitar makers, we were very fortunate uh, that we make the type of product that's a uh, a play at home, stay at home product, as it's called, which which uh, a lot of people who were in lockdown mode at the beginning of the pandemic, well, a lot of guitars just wanted guitars wanted more guitars, and they could order them online also, and. Uh, a lot of people wanted to learn how to play guitar. So for a lot of uh, guitar companies, I'd say almost all of them, we may have seen an upswing in business during the pandemic, which we're very thankful for and, and we're very fortunate, uh, as opposed to many other sectors of our industry and other industries that suffered greatly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it we, we held pretty steady during the pandemic. Yes, indeed. As did many other guitar manufacturers. Yeah, at least people had something very good to do. I mean, music at home, lock it down, mm -hmm. and just not watching television all day long. Music is, is another one. Right, yeah. right. Okay, Matt, in the last 20 years, we saw that the quality of the entry-level and intermediate guitars had improved a lot. I mean, buying a sub-brand guitar 20 years ago meant to be a problem-solving expert and, in many cases, still playing a not 100% reliable instrument. And the gap between the European and US-made and the Far East production seemed to be mm, extremely wide. But today, however, even low-budget instruments are quite reliable, both as hardware and craft. How this shift has happened, and what is the actual value of the US or Japan production? Well, over the years, uh, Asian countries that were known for making very low-end instruments have become more sophisticated in their abilities to, to manufacture. You know, China and Indonesia, for instance. So for the price of that guitar, you're getting a much better value than you may have at one point, you know, in previous years, as, as you just described. Uh, some of the factories in those countries have are, are run by owners in Korea and Japan that have, because of the cost of manufacturing in Korea, for instance, they decided to shut down their Korea operation and open one in Indonesia, for instance. And most of their uh, business that they used to get at their Korean factory has been shifted there. So because they're run by uh, companies that were had, had, had a higher level of skill in making guitars, their, their, their skills have improved uh, accordingly. And... Uh, once again, you're getting a much better guitar for the few hundred dollars that you're paying for a Chinese or Indonesian-made guitar than you did a few years ago. And the lines have blurred, uh, at least people in, in the industry uh, have, have seen. And where a guitar is made is no longer as... Uh, uh, a tabu. doesn't define the quality of the guitar as much as it used to. Uh, it's really what you get for the, for, for the dollar, not where it's made as much. Because you might have a factory in a certain country that's uh, better at making guitars than what you thought was a more advanced country in guitar manufacturing. And that's just the way it is. Uh, some people look at the back of a headstock and see where it's made and automatically put it into a certain category as you know better or worse but it doesn't, it's not that simple anymore. Yeah, I agree. But guitars for ESP is not just production, it's relationships and uh, artists and lots of music in a very, very big venues in this 
40 years. And what's the secret behind the many solid and long-standing relationships you have with your artists? I mean, and how do you keep an eye on young talents too? Well, the, the secret, uh, well, having a good working relationship with these artists is very important. Um, but when all is said and done, it comes down to the instrument itself. Um, you know, guitarists don't necessarily come to ESP because they want to work with Matt or Tony or something. They come here because of the instrument. And this is my 35th year with the company. And Kirk Hammett from Metallica, it's also his 35th year. It's very easy to remember for me because we both started the same, in 1987. With the, the same company. year. And I, I asked him basically the same question you just asked me. And this this interview will be posted on our website shortly. But I remember his uh, answer to that question about you've arrived at 35 years with ESP. Why why have you stuck around so long? What what is it about the partnership that's that's lasted so long? And he said the guitars still sound incredible. My original guitars sound as good as the day I got them. And they're dependable until the end, and I'm happy about it, and I only see ESP getting better. And when you ask uh, an artist who's been with us for, you know, have, have big enough or, or long enough to uh, have experience, extensive experience playing ESP on tour and in the studio, you generally get the same answer. They, they can rely on the guitars. They're built the way they want them to be built, and they perform the way they expect them to. They don't have to worry about that. They got plenty of other things to worry about. <laughs> and that's the thing that I think most artists will say. The guitars are dependable and uh, built the way they want them and do what they need them to do. Yeah, and that, that's and the key. It's not such a big secret, really. It's what, we, it's what, it's the way it should be. Um, and as far as new artists, a lot of artists have come to us, especially in the earlier days when word got out that if you want, if you have a vision or an idea for a guitar that you don't see anywhere or you can't get anywhere because you, you, you can only buy what's in the, in the store, ESP will do it for you. And as we started working with artists, they, the word spread among them that we're the company to go to for that. And uh, and so did the, uh, the the general public started to see what we were making for artists and understood that ESP had a custom, has a custom shop and there were a, a wide variety of options for you to choose from. And it doesn't sound like such a big deal now because almost every company has a custom shop. But back in the in the 80s, it was uh, more uncommon. Yeah, really uncommon. Rare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it gave us a big advantage as far when it came to attracting players to the company. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Matt, I'm curious. Um, I, I mean, you you've seen 35 years of ESP production and innovations. According to you, what are for the three innovations aspects or crucial moments that made ESP Ltd. the world renowned brand we all know today? Well, I think I'm going to have to give you more than three. Yeah. So I know you're asking for three. But yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> um, all right, sounds good. The, uh, I would say when the New York office was opened in the mid-80s, let's call it 84, um, and ESP made their first step towards becoming an international company, not just a company known in Japan, was a, a huge beginning step to get us uh, – a global reputation. And after that office was open in in 85 I think George Lynch was one of the first signature artists that we signed and George was very uh visible back then with touring and 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 recording and so, and videos and so on and he's one of the guys that put ESP on the map as a company that could make custom guitars and not just vintage reproduction guitars and parts, which is what we were known for at the time. So 
and and then getting uh, in the following years people like Kirk and James Hetfield and so many others in the in the following few years that are still with us today, those were uh, definitely crucial uh, happenings that that uh, helped make us a global company. And uh, in '87, when I started with the company, we were making mostly we were a parts company and we made reproductions of vintage guitars. That was our product line. In 87, we started to develop our own identity when we introduced the first um, eclipses and horizons and mirages and, you know, newer shapes and newer designs that were um, nothing like what we'd done before. So and once again, instead of being known as a company that, are, that was making um, what we call the 400 series, which were traditional reproductions, uh, we, were, we, we were making our own instruments. And that was uh, in the 87 catalog, and that was a very big step for us. And what else do I have on here? Um, jumping to 96, we first introduced LTD, which, as you probably know, is a more uh, affordable version of the designs that we had made for the previous you know, 20 years, and uh, not made by our exclusive ESP-owned factory when we branched out into different different countries for manufacturing. And that was may have made the biggest difference in the, the sales growth of the company, more so than anything we, we ever did. And a um, few, few years later, in, uh, in 2015, we took on... Uh, Takamine as a distributor, and of course it didn't uh, didn't uh, have as much an effect of an effect on our electric business. Uh, but it's the first time we entered the acoustic guitar uh, world with a very uh, reputable and high quality brand. A long story brand, so, uh, also, that, yes. That's become, that's become a large uh, percentage of our sales because. Uh, the, the acoustic market is actually bigger than the electric market. So we we're very glad to get a foothold in there. It's gone very well for us. And um, we op okay, I'm going to make this the last thing, I promise. This is, uh, <laughs> we opened uh, a factory in the USA in uh, North Hollywood near our current uh, headquarters to make a, a USA-made line of ESP guitars. And uh, right now, the demand for that is uh, outpacing our current uh, output. So delivery time has gotten a little bit uh, longer than I, I'd hoped it to be. But having a high demand is not, you know, there are worse problems you can have. Now, now I'm just trying to get the, out the, uh, the capacity of the factory higher while maintaining the quality that we've established and become known for. So, so I would say that's, uh, those are the main things. You know, that's like uh, five minutes. Yeah, that's a bunch of very... Breakdown of 35 years. Yeah, yeah. big bullet points. I mean, um, great, right. big, big <laughs> milestones, indeed. Listen, Matt, your instruments always matched perfectly with uh, the electronic and pickup choices. And uh, you always opted for uh, world-leading manufacturers like EMG pickups. But amongst the pickup supplier, there's one small boutique manufacturer called Bernacle, which over the years has gained the interest and trust of many guitarists worldwide. How did you start collaborating with them and why? Well, as with uh, many other things, um, we first started seeing requests by artists for bare knuckle pickups. And when you see that start to happen, it usually means that consumers will, uh, the demand by consumers will follow. Once you build the guitars for the artists, and if they're highly prominent artists with, with a large visibility, 
if they're seen out there playing bare knuckles, you may get more requests from customers for bare knuckles. And uh, once a couple of people, a couple of artists asked for uh, bare knuckle pickups in their in their custom guitars or their signature guitars, we knew that there was uh, something to it. So we started to use them on, you know, not not on, not as much as EMG or Duncan, for instance, but we started using them in our instruments. And we contacted them and we worked out, uh, we, you know, we have a working relationship with them. I think they're in the UK. And uh, that's how it started. An artist came to us with a request for bare knuckles and that's how we became uh, aware of them. So. Okay. Okay. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And what are the requirements to start producing a new model? And above all, what necessarily must be in the DNA of a new ESP or LTD guitar to bring it out in the market? Well, if you're talking about a, like a, a signature model, uh, an artist signature model, quite often the the uh, the idea or the request is brought to us by the artist. So they an artist usually has a hand in designing his signature model. Some sometimes they'll design it from the ground up. Sometimes it'll be a joint effort between us and them. But the only thing we require is that the design be you know, good design, of course, but also that they're willing to support it and they're passionate enough about it that they'll be playing it uh, on tour and, and anywhere else that they have uh, performances to uh, to give the model a credibility and, and association with them. And if we can get that combination happening, we, we might introduce that as a signature model. But as far as regular production models, Quite often, new models uh, are um, just upgraded or modified um, versions of of existing previously successful models with you know, different finishes or different electronics or you know and so on. Um, bigger risk may be designing a new shape or something never before tested by us, and uh, you know you have to be careful about that because. I found that guitarists, even though they may have a reputation for doing, uh, you know, playing really uh, wild looking guitars, I guess, with custom graphics, and they're relatively conservative. Um, they always go back to the single cutaway or double cutaway model, maybe with their input on changing it somewhat. But if you try to put a never before seen shape out there, to really, you know, it's usually a tough sell. Yeah, I need to be brave. But, um, we, you know what I mean, right? So, but we have in the probably the four top four people at our company, uh, oh, probably over a hundred years experience in in uh, selling guitars, making and selling guitars. So, we have a pretty good feel for what what's going to work and what's not going to work, and. Uh, I'm not saying we're right every time, but we have a pretty good track record. Yeah. As you said before, like many um, other brands, also ESP has its own custom shop and one of the first, perhaps, which allows customers not only to purchase master-built guitars, but to build tailored and extremely personalized instruments directly through your website. But is there a sort of pre-selection or do all orders get manufacturers and maybe just a curiosity what's the most peculiar guitar or bass that you built in answer to the first part of your question all orders get manufactured um and the same hands build a guitar for an, an artist uh that build a guitar for a consumer who orders one through a music store. So one isn't getting better quality uh, than the other in the instrument that he ultimately gets. But um, we've built a few strange things over the years, even though most custom orders are, are variations on models that we already make. Uh, 
we we did something like a hollow lucite body filled with liquid uh blue liquid called the wave caster for a Kerr comet and i think the blue liquid was supposed to emulate a you know waves crashing or something like that and it leaked so it never really went anywhere and um it's probably sitting in a wet case somewhere on on somebody's shelf so that that was something i was glad to see fade away you know um we made a guitar for Andrew WK that's shaped like a slice of pizza. And he um, did the graphics on it, the, all the, the toppings and the sauce and everything. And it sounds crazy, but he did a great job on it. And that guitar, he plays on tour and is fully functional. And uh, not something I would want to put into production or anything, but you know, you asked about some strange guitars. That was yeah, fun. yeah, I mean, peculiar, sure. yes, strange. Yeah, yeah, but we've done quite a few things over the years and uh but we do uh we we rarely would turn down someone's order for a custom order unless it was something extremely offensive that uh you know we wouldn't want to put our logo on although yeah okay we've we've we've, we've done some offensive things but we there we got we gotta have we gotta draw a line somewhere yeah indeed matt just the last question Uh, for you and is more personal uh, before landing on ESP in the 1987 your experience made you work alongside many extraordinary bands such Aerosmith, Motorhead and many others what do you remember of those days? Well, um, I remember them favorably it's a uh... it was a pretty wild ride because it was, you know, it was still the 80s And, uh, but I made a lot of good, uh, friends and contacts, uh, that I still maintain today and some in my working relationship with ESP, some are like family still. And but I learned a lot of things that apply to what we do at ESP also, uh, seeing, you know, guitars in, in a live and recording situation and seeing what's required of them by the artist playing them. Um, I, when I started working for Aerosmith, I was, I was uh, just getting started out, and one of their crew from, that was with them from their very early days, he, he was actually the guy I was hired to replace, and I had to hire him back because he knew where all the bodies were buried. That's, once again, I don't know how that phrase will translate. <laughs> But um, he, t he told me a couple of, one time he said to me that when the band is on stage, this was with Aerosmith, he said that failure is not an option. And I thought he was being overly dramatic, like, you know, this isn't Apollo 13 or anything, what's going on here? And, but then I, I, I realized, I soon realized that when the guitarist, who you're working for, or in ESP's case, building guitars for, when he's on stage, whether it's in front of 50 or 50,000 people, you're the only thing between him and them. And you can't fail in your responsibilities. Yeah. And I, that's what he was trying to tell me, and I completely understand and agree with him now. And I try to think about that when we build a guitar for uh an artist to take on tour and or a consumer to play and that's uh that was an important uh lesson that i learned but it was uh a great experience but it wasn't going to be a lifelong thing for me and fortunately i had the opportunity after spending the decade doing it uh to go work at esp It's a very deep story of your life. I mean, just not only in ESP, but also before. And I, I want to thank you very much for your time because, it, as I said at the, by the phone when we spoke at the beginning, it's an honor to meet people like you that just not only made the results and uh, the story we are living nowadays, but also you are still... Uh, a proof of 
or and I mean the teller, the storyteller of those days. And I guess uh, bringing up and the story or of a specific path and um, period of time um, experience it's uh, always a gift for anyone looking at this kind of interviews and contents so thank you very much matt for your time and i really hope this 2022 will be a new year of great success and uh, music and so much fun for you and your team thanks a lot well, thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed it very much, and uh, um, I'd like to come back sometime or at least come and see you in person next time I'm over there. <laughs>